So, if you have your sword of the spirit, your Bible, I, I ask you to turn it on and <laughs> open your Bible app and scroll to Matthew chapter 7. While I give you, I'm, and I'm going to make it real brief, a very, very brief review of the first seven chapters of Matthew. In answer to all kinds, like hundreds, if not thousands of prophecies from the Old Testament, the Messiah has come. God in the flesh has come. The king of God's kingdom has arrived. The Messiah, the savior of the world. And he's begun teaching. And he does something really interesting. He begins his teaching by gathering, well, quite literally, subjects for his kingdom. And he takes them up onto a hill, which we call the Mount of Beatitudes, right? And he begins to teach them. And this is an important part of our teaching this morning. He takes them away from the masses of people, brings a small group up the hill. And then for the last six or seven weeks, and actually more to continue because we're going to actually be going back and forth. And I know Rick's going to be back in the Beatitudes next week. So just bear with me on this. But he's been teaching them how, what life in the kingdom looks like. It's about how you love, how to give away of yourself, doing good works, praying, fasting, all of it from a heart that loves God and others as its highest motivation, which, by the way, is a deep contrast to the rest of the world that is constantly seeking selfish gain, selfish happiness, or whatever, me, 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 me. And Jesus says, don't seek stuff because stuff doesn't ever satisfy, but seek him and his way of loving. And then, by the way, he, a little bit, some of it was pretty hard. I watched Steve's message um, online last week, and I heard what he said. He, you know, Jesus says, though you are evil. <laughs> and Steve's like, what pastor wants to preach that passage? Yeah, I was grateful he did. Because, you know, yeah, people are like, evil? What? Well, Jesus is on to this. We do sin. Yeah, what is sin? But evil, right? You know, hard teachings. And he hasn't even got to the good news about why he came and his sacrifice and forgiveness. Of sin. No, no, he just calls it you who are sinful, right? So today's teaching is interesting, but it's actually the last teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to I sort of set it up by saying we're going to cover four iconic verses today that sometimes guys just take that one iconic verse and they preach on that verse. But when I started to do that, I realized they all kind of went together. And now what do I mean by an iconic verse? Well, if I say something like, um, but I had an example, oh, God so loved. Yeah, see, every, every, everybody, everybody knows that, right? Um, love your neighbor as, yeah, those are iconic verses. So we have four iconic verses that you're super familiar with, even if, even if you're like, don't ever read your Bible, you're not a Christian or whatever, you're just, you know, you randomly stopped in because you heard there was coffee. <laughs> you're going to know some of these, right? Like, check it out. The first one, honestly, probably. Okay, verse uh, 13, uh, chapter 7, 13, Matthew. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, this verse is a classic example of what we do with it of human nature run amok because there's a lot of really wrong ways to kind of look at this. Like we have extremes from both, you know, believers and unbelievers, but, you know, some people like could read that and be like, oh, yeah, you could see a preacher getting up here going, make sure you're on the little path, you know. How do we know that you're one of the few because there's only going to be a few and everybody out there, they're all going to hell, you know, and like kind of like preach this like fear and, and sense, you know, give you insecurity, whatever. Or we could look at this and be like, well, that doesn't seem fair. <laughs> God only saves a few people. I don't know that I'm okay with that idea. And what is the percentage, you know? And no matter who you are reading that, you're probably pretty convinced you're in the narrow gate, right, as well. It's everybody else that's not. And look what we're doing. We're kind of looking outside, looking at this one verse and sort of casting judgment on it, right? But actually... That whole point without context misses what I believe after looking at all the context, what he's teaching. So what is he actually teaching about this? Well, I think we got to continue on. And here's iconic verse number two. Verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious as wolves. Now, isn't this interesting? Whether you're a believer or not, you all, everybody knows that concept of what? 
a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And so we kind of all know what it means. I was trying to think of examples. Uh, I'll just give you a quick one I thought of last week. Um, often when people go off to college, I take them out to lunch and we talk about college. Often with the young girls that are going off to college, I give them a little warning. And I usually tell them a story or a couple stories. Because I have this visual in my head when I was in college standing on Del Playa Street in Isla Vista. And if you've been there, you can already picture the scene on a Friday night. And there was a guy standing there, or kind of weaving there, on a sidewalk. And some pretty girls were walking by. And he goes, hey, baby! Rubber, rubber. I can't tell you what he said. Because <laughs> it would be really inappropriate, right? And I remember the girls walking by kind of went like... <laughs> and I remember thinking, Does, maybe I should get, offer this guy some help. Like, what I wanted to say was, hey, bud, has that ever worked? <laughs> like, I think you need a better strategy, because that's not a good strategy. Now, here's my point, young, beautiful ladies. Yeah? You don't need to worry about that guy. That guy, that, he's so obvious, whatever. The guy you need to look out for is the, oh, wow, you're so pretty. Oh, you're a Christian? Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, my uncle's a pastor. That's so cool, yeah? And by the way, yeah, you know your earrings really match your shoes, Yeah? Look at ladies, I got you right there. You're like, well, what, what a sensitive guy. No guy ever says that. That's the guy you need. Huh, am I right, people? That's the guy to look out for. That guy, that's the classic. Now, what Jesus is talking about is the religious version of that guy. He's the guy from up front going, you know, you're really the most important person here, aren't you, yeah? You're basically a good person and don't believe in that guy that's saying, you know, yet you're evil and you're wrong and you're sinful. In fact, you should cast judgment on that God. What kind of good God wouldn't like you? Because you're so you. In fact, you should also believe in the God that believes your judgments about other people. That's what God's really all about. In fact, you should find your own truth and follow your what? heart, right? Not follow your creator, follow your maker, follow your God in heaven. No, no, no. Follow your heart, right? That is what Jesus is talking about when he means false prophets. By the way, how do we recognize false prophets? Well, Jesus says you'll recognize them. Well, verse 16, he says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? He says your fruit. Now that begs the question, what does that look like? Well, let's just go ahead and read from Galatians chapter 5. 19 to 23, there's two types of fruit. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Okay, there's that fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. There, how easy was that? That's look for fruit from the people that you're hearing from. And then we get to our third iconic verse of the morning. And it's a doozy, but I know most of you are familiar with it. Verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Everybody hates that verse, don't, don't we, yeah? Like, like, no preacher's like, what should I preach on today? I think I'll, I know, I'll pick on that one. Unless they kind of want to be like, I'm going to scare you into behaving, right? Because you shouldn't be really sure. You never know. What if you ended up that guy? Because that's kind of like the fear factor is, what if I, because I said, Lord, Lord, and I preach in your name, and I've, I've driven out a demon, and I've prayed for miracles. Could it be me? Could I be one of those that, like, get faked out or whatever? But the question is, and by the way, people debate this, who is he talking about? Is he talking about the false prophets, because we're in the context of false prophets? Or is he talking about people that follow false prophets? The answer, I have twofold. One, I don't know, and two, yes, I imagine both. Perhaps he is talking about false prophets that lead people astray, but the people who are led astray are just as lost as the false prophets. But I want to say this to you all that are here. This, I don't believe he says this, and it was never intention to scare the sheep, so to speak. We, the flock. We, the flock. I, I th in fact, that's not remotely what I think he's doing. 
the, he's not calling us to question our faith, but he's to drive us to faith. Because think about this. If you're concerned that, do I not have enough faith, where would you go to find that faith? To Jesus, who gives us saving faith. So just the fact that you're concerned, I don't want to be that guy, is to say, my fear is that I won't measure up. And the truth is, we won't measure up. We are not going to get to heaven, and Jesus is going to say, you did enough. You were good enough. You had faith enough. He's going to say, where was your faith? And we recognize my faith, my works, it's dependent on your faith and your work that you did for us. And so I believe what Jesus is doing here is he's warning us. He's warning us to pay attention and be on the lookout for false prophets because the more I thought about it this week, the more I realized, you realize we are bombarded daily, weekly, monthly, by the minute with false messages. And so I thought of some examples that I want to share with you right now. One was kind of funny. I was having coffee with John Enns two weeks ago. We were obviously talking about the Bible and things of the Lord. And a guy apparently was listening. And he came over and he starts out like this. Hey, man, I couldn't help but listen to what you guys were saying. And I want you to know. And then he gave us his background. I've studied theology and I've studied the Bible and da-da-da-da-da-da. And the thing is this and da-da-da-da. And... and, da, 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 and, and John and stops him and says, hey, that's great. You know, I'd love to get together with you and talk to you about what you've learned. And I'm like, wow, John, that was good. Like, yeah, this guy loves the Lord, knows how to share the Lord. And check out the guy's response. It was so classic. He goes, oh, okay, but you can't proselytize to me, right? You know what that word means? You can't, like, you know, share your faith with me. He goes, because what I believe is that, see, the universe is a bit, and then guess what he did? proselytized to us. <laughs> and for, he starts launching into what he believes and where we've gone wrong. And I start to go like, hey, buddy, you're pro And John's like, he puts my hand down because he's more faithful than I am, right? Because <laughs> I'm about to tell him, you're doing the same thing you're telling us not to do. And John's like, just, just, just let him go because he's a better witnesser than I am, John Ann's, right? But isn't that classic? He didn't think he was proselyt he, he didn't think he was proselytizing to us. He's just telling us what? How it really is. And I want you to know that every day we're bombarded with these ideas about what's really going on. Like, you know me, I always love to pick on commercial advertising, because I think it's kind of funny, because guys that write taglines for commercials, you know, they're not really doing the deep philosophical math on what they're saying, right? They're just like, well, maybe this, you know, they're trying to get a promotion. Will that work? You know, <laughs> this bud's for you. How's that? You know, is that, is that good? They're not doing the deeper. But me, I'm a nerd, right? So when I hear these slogans, I'm like, really? What is that? Like, let me give a couple examples. Some of these I've used before, but I always, I can't get away from Sprite. Remember this one? Obey your thirst. Really? Like, yeah, like nine o'clock in the morning, you're cracking a Budweiser and your wife's like, really? Nine o'clock in the morning, you're like, hey, man, I'm thirsty. <laughs> got to do what I got to do, right? Obey your thirst. If I'm thirsty, I, I, I got to drink. Got to drink what I'm going to drink. Got to do. Like, it, you know, by the way, I thought of an interesting example this week because I heard somebody tell me this like weeks ago. We, you know, we'd kind of called a guy out on the carpet for straying, you might say. And you know what he said? He goes, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm a man. I have needs. You see where you see obey your fleshly desires obey you got you got needs yep you got to take care of them how about coke what's the coke it's the real thing what does that even mean like what that's that's it that's the it's the thing because it's well it's real i mean it's really 40 grams of sugar is really all it is but it's real it's supposed to make us think it's something important right but I thought this Super Bowl ad, I even asked Lucas, we stole it, sorry, edit that out from the broadcast. Um, we legally downloaded it off the internet. <laughs> Lucas did, not me. Uh, <laughs> this Super Bowl ad, just go ahead, roll the ad, Lucas, sorry, we'll ask for forgiveness. Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> you're not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfied. Okay. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. I got three major things with that. Okay, number one, the reason you're a jerk is not because you're a jerk, it's because you're hungry, right? So already, it's not you, right? It, and, and, then, and then, you need to be you, right? That's what it says, because you're not you, right? Unless you have a Snickers. So first of all, you is the most important thing because you are basically a good person. Like, if you have a Snickers, then you're really a good person. And then the last one, Snickers satisfies. Oh, good. I'm so glad to know that Snickers, that does it. That'll do it. The thing I'm looking for in my life is a Snickers, right? See, they kind of present. See, I go, I'm a total Bible nerd, right? Isn't that nerdy? But look what it's saying about who you are and what you do and behavior and what's good and what's not good, what answers, what satisfies. And by the way, my point, you know, it's easy to hack on sugar or whatever, but think about it. All week long, if you look on your phone, if you look on the TV, Eat this, drink this, smoke this, take this, and you'll be happy, fulfilled. Chicks will dig you. You'll have love, joy, and peace, and all, all this stuff. Total aside, you know, um, years ago when ISIS still controlled most of, what was it, Iraq and Syria, whatever, and, and, and legions of young Westerners, Canada, Canadians, Americans, Brits, were like teenagers, were leaving warm, safe, dry places with good food and safety to fly to these hideous war-torn places and join ISIS. And there was an American general that commented on this, and they asked him, what would drive somebody who doesn't even consider themselves a Muslim when they start online to end up going to these hideous places and likely get hilled, killed excuse me, in a hideous faction? And you know what he said? He said, because they offer purpose and they offer meaning. And people in this life, this Western world we live in, are searching for purpose and meaning, and somebody offers that. Come fight for a cause. You see, Snickers doesn't satisfy. And so people are looking, and they're vulnerable to hearing false prophets about this. I got another one for you. Ready? Uh, came out this week. Did you know Harvard University got a new chaplain this week? The chaplain. Think about that. The chaplain of Harvard University. So before I set this up, I want you to know, out of curiosity, I went to the Harvard website, and I read from their own website how Harvard was founded. I'm going to read it to you. Harvard University was founded in 1636 with the intention of establishing a school to train Christian ministers. Are you with me? So isn't it ironic that this week they named their new chaplain and he is an atheist? Isn't that fascinating? Okay, now his name is um, Greg Epstein or whatever. Now, by the way, when I think of an a atheist chaplain, I'm sorry, but I can't help but, were you here when Tim Hawkins did his um, atheist worship songs? Because he heard that there are these, they really have these, apparently in Florida, there's atheist mega churches, and he's like, what do they sing? <laughs> no one loves the little children, no one, right, yeah? <laughs> I am an A, I am a T, I am a, anyways, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but the truth is more insidious, and actually to tell you the truth, the more I thought about it, the more it made sense that they would put an atheist as their chaplain. Why? It said, you know, one of the statements was to accommodate a wide range of beliefs. Well, why not have a guy who doesn't believe in anything, in God, right? And so the title of this guy's book, I, I think I have a picture, is called Good Without God. And, and the, the sense of it is, is you don't need God to be good because why? You are good, right? In fact, by the way, how different is that from Steve's teaching last week? Jesus says, though you are evil. Isn't that interesting, right? Yeah? Um, by the way, a quote from the book says this, we don't look to a God for answers, we are each other's answers. And I was like, oh boy. Remember that fruits of the spirit? What kind of fruit do you think you'd get out of that? We are each other's answers. In other words, we just need to look to each other for answers. Here's an idea. Real quick, let's go around the room and everybody tell us what they believe about COVID masks and vaccines. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll all end up with love, joy, peace, patience, <laughs> kindness. Ah, right? No, we don't look to each other for answers. We as Christians, we look to God. Amen? 
Now, here's the thing. I'm not just hacking this guy, but it's super informative about the world we live in. This is the world we're headed to. Looking for what? My own truth. Not some truth out there from a bigger than me, but me, my truth, okay? Which is a good, by the way, introduction, introduction to the final verses for this morning. But before we get to the final verses of this morning, I have to put it in context. I want to reiterate where we started with this morning. Remember what's going on here in the context. Jesus, who claims to be God's son, who created the world and everything and everybody in it, has come to earth to establish his kingdom, right? And he's recruiting subjects, and he's, the people, by the way, are super lost, right? They're like, in fact, I just want to read this verse. It comes up later in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 9, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And I thought, what a perfect example for our community today, our, the world we live in today. Believe this, believe that. No, believe this. Do this and you'll be happy. No, do this and you'll be happy. Here's what's truth. Here's no, that's what's true, right? Harassed like sheep without a shepherd. He's called them up onto a mountainside, away from all of that hoopla, right? And he has lessons for them. And I thought, consider ourselves right now. Quite literally, think of ourselves right now. Those of us gathered in this room and those of you at home listening online. In this moment, we have been sort of pulled up onto a mountainside, away from the hoopla. Especially you at home. I hope you don't have your phones out, okay? Yeah? Get off our phones. Get away from all the la, 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 right? No commercials telling us what to buy, no news outlet telling us how to think, no social media right now telling us how to be happy. Oh, little flock, like Jesus says, now with that in mind, let's read his final verses from the Sermon on the Mount. It starts in verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand, and the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and the beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I love the Therefore, what's it there for? In the light of everything I've just told you over the last weeks, these six chapters, this Sermon on the Mount in the context of don't listen to the false prophets of the world. Therefore, in the light of all of that, he says, listen to my words. Put them in practice. Now, the analogy is so simple, right? Like, we all know what he means. Yeah, you have a foundation. We've all been through storms. We all know that, like, if, you know, you don't have a good foundation, you're likely to fall. I don't need to explain all that. Some people argue, is he talking about, like, the storms of this life when a sudden emergency bubbles up? Or is he talking about judgment at the end of our lives? The answer is yes, because they're both the same. What does it matter? Christ is speaking truth to us now. He says, follow and obey now. Doesn't matter if it's now or right before we die or when we die. It's all the same, right? But I want you to consider a couple things about the proof of his words. This is interesting to me. In fact, just the fact that here we are 2,000 years later is pretty good proof, isn't it, that his words are true. Because, you know, we think what we're going through right now is so earth-shaking, whatever, but think about those who clung to these words for the last 2,000 years, and they have been through multiple nations and empires that rose and fall, different philosophies and theories and social movements and wars and persecutions and plagues, and yet here we are, and the reason we're still here is because all those saints stuck by these words. They were standing on the solid rock of Christ, and that's why we're still teaching these words today. The teaching has survived. <laughs> I wrote this. <laughs> Jesus' teaching has survived both persecutions of Christians and actually the legalization of Christianity. <laughs> Hard to argue which one was worse for the faith, if you know your history. If you don't, come talk to me later, right? And yet here we are continuing to pass on the keys to living in the kingdom. So I want to wrap up this morning with these ideas. We are bombarded by messages and teachings daily 
The leading theory right now in our culture is my truth is my truth. I create my own reality. I create my own moral code, my own standards. In effect, I've created my own God because, well, basically at the end of the day, I am God, right? My own religion. How's that going? How's that going for us as a society? And when things go wrong, where do you turn when your philosophy doesn't work? And so today, Jesus, with great compassion, with great love, and with his wisdom, and the proofs about the truth of who he is, he invites you into his kingdom, onto his rock, which is not shaken. Yeah. It's not easy. I love that. I love that we don't sugarcoat it. He says this will be difficult. He's been teaching us about giving away, about not being selfish, about forgiving the people that sin against us, about even loving our enemies. I wouldn't write that into my code if I was making my own truth, and yet Jesus says this is the way to be on the rock. Blessed are you is what he said. When you're poor in spirit, when you mourn, when you're merciful, when you make peace, when you're persecuted, he says, don't get angry, don't be lustful, don't sin, keep your word, don't seek revenge, love your enemies, don't judge them, pray, fast, be rich in good deeds, and he wraps all this up by saying, listen to my words and put them in practice because this will save you, right? Now, I want to end up with a word of encouragement here this morning, and that is it's not easy, I get it, it's not easy to do what he says which is why he says, put your faith in me. And it's so cool. Think about this. He fulfilled these hundreds, thousands of prophecies to prove who he was when he came. And then while he was here, he prophesied about his own life, that he would be killed for the forgiveness of our sins, that he would be resurrected on the third day, that he would ascend to heaven and that he would send the apostles out and that his word would go all around the world. And everything that he predicted also came true. This is who we are asked to trust this morning, which is why... I love it. Um, in, the, in the book of John, I think it's in chapter 9, Jesus gives a hard teaching about who he is. He says, I am the bread of heaven. You must partake in me. I am the truth. And a whole bunch of people split. It was too difficult of a teaching. One of my favorite scenes of the Bible is he turns, and there's Peter, and there's the boys. And he says, well, you guys too? You gonna leave too? And I love Peter's, Peter's answer. What does Peter mean anyways? Rock, right? But it wasn't his natural name. Jesus gave him that name. Pebble, I think it means. He says, I love this, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And this morning, Jesus says, hear my words and obey them. Give me your life. Stick with me. And when the storms come, and they will come. And if you ever have me at your door at 5.30 in the morning, I hope and trust and pray that you're standing on a solid rock. Snickers satisfies, but Jesus saves. We don't, we don't judge God. God judges us. And I'm not good enough. My faith is in him that is good. My faith is not in my ability to hold on to my salvation. My faith is in that he holds me in the palm of his hand. And I pray that you have put your faith in the rock. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your words this morning, God. They are challenging, God, but they are good. And they're good because you are good. You have answered every prophecy about you and therefore will answer every still to come prophecy about you. And so we rest in you. Our lives have fallen short before you. We have discovered sin in our lives, God, that we are not worthy. And therefore, we have looked to you, our Savior. Thank you that you shed your blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And we ask now in Jesus' name, Lord, that as we leave this place, that you would guide us and shape us and mold us and teach us to be more and more obedient to your words every day, God that when the storms of life come and at the end of our lives, God, there we will be in your house, firmly on you, our rock. 
In Jesus Christ's name, everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, go get a Snickers or something. I don't know. You'll never eat a Snickers now, I hope, without going, ah, I'm satisfied. I'm, yeah, 40 grams of sugar.